Vikings did whatever the hell they wanted. They were stealth and ruthless seafaring Norsemen and women who disregarded conventional battlefield tactics, methods, and customs of the time. These attributes weren't seen as cowardly acts of warfare, they were regarded as smart tactics in a successful pillaging. Today we're exploring what it was really like on a Viking raid. Make sure after watching you subscribe to our channel Weird History, leave a comment and let us know what you think about this video. Let's understand why these Norsemen turned to raiding and pillaging. It wasn't because they loved violence and it was something to pass the time. Viking raids were a matter of survival. But it wasn't always like that, though. Early in the Viking Age, between the 8th and 9th century, Vikings fought for honor. They were made up of small tribes that didn't adhere to law, authority, or religion, and violence was used as a way to settle disputes with other tribes. Eventually, defending the tribe's honor and appealing to their gods of war became secondary. Vikings soon began to go on raids to acquire wealth and material goods. They often targeted Christian monasteries in Britain. Why? Because these monasteries were easy prey for the Vikings. The defenseless monks who inhabited them were sitting friar ducks. A tribe of Vikings as small as 30 warriors could take down a monastery without breaking a sweat. As a matter of fact, the beginning of the Viking Age is normally regarded as June 8, 793 AD, when the first documented Viking attack took place at a monastery on the island of Lindisfarne in northern England. Alcuin, a scholar in Charlemagne's court at the time, wrote of that particular raid, Never before has such terror appeared in Britain, as we now have suffered from a pagan race. The heathens poured out the blood of the saints around the altar and trampled on the bodies of saints in the temple of God, like dung in the streets. But to the Vikings, a monastery was too good to pass up. They were filled to the rafters with treasures like gold, silver, jewels, and books. Monasteries were also a valuable source for food, drink, cattle, clothes, and tools. A Viking pillaging a Christian monastery was like raiding a bed, bath, and beyond, except without all the patchouli fragrance. The fact that Viking raids were aimed at churches and monasteries was regarded as particularly horrifying at the time. No one was safe from the Vikings, not even men of God. When Vikings weren't raiding monasteries, they were battling the armies of various countries and sometimes other Vikings. These fights weren't as simple as punking some monks, though. These battles required strategy. Vikings relied on the element of surprise. Vikings were well known for ambushing their targets by hiding in the woods and lying in wait for their opponents as they walked along established roads. Of course, every now and then, Vikings would adhere to traditional rules of warfare. For example, if a tribe of Vikings was confronted on land by an opponent of equal size and strength, they'd begin their battle by forming a shield wall. It worked like this. Before one spear was thrown, warriors from each tribe would face off with each other in a wedge-like formation. This was a shield wall. Depending on the size of the army, a shield could be made up of five to six rows of warriors holding round, handheld wooden shields. The bulk of the wedge formation was usually made up of heavily armed men with berserkers at the very front of the wedge. Yes, berserkers. More on that in a minute. Archers and the other veterans of the tribe would then line up behind the wedge, and bodyguards called herds would surround their leaders and chiefs at the back. The ground battle would finally begin when a warrior threw a spear over their enemy's lines. Waves of spears followed with armor-piercing arrows fired off by archers close behind. Often, the opening salvo determined the fight. Eventually, one of the tribes would stagger and reel away from the spears and arrows that rained down upon them. Of course, if both tribes remained standing after the initial downpour of spears, the warriors of each side pushed forward to wage close-quarter hand-to-hand combat with their enemies. Okay, berserkers. They deserve some special acknowledgement. We all know that Vikings were insane warriors, but they were nothing compared to berserkers, a special group of elite Vikings who were so badass they didn't even wear armor or helmets. They fought in loincloths, and the only weapon they used was a light shield. Berserkers were skilled warriors for sure, but the thing that made them so dangerous was that they had no fear. Before battle, they would work themselves up into a crazed, trance-like state called Berserk Gang, and then fight with blind fury. While in this frenzied state during raids, berserkers lost all human capacity for reason or awareness and were known to scream and howl like wolves or mad dogs. You now know where Wolverine's berserker mode was inspired from. 
If you believe the lore, these berserkers were said to have spiritual magical powers from the god of war, Odin. It's also hypothesized that berserkers would prep for battle by drinking gallons of alcohol and consuming magic mushrooms. Although, most people on this concoction would just start playing guitar by a campfire. Some botanists have claimed that berserker behavior could have been caused by eating a plant called bog myrtle, one of the main spices in Scandinavian beer. In land raids, tribes would position their berserkers at the front of the wedge. The boar's snout would then rush their enemy's battle lines and take their formation apart in hand-to-hand -hand combat. At this point, the raid would turn into a straight-up Donnybrook, and the tribe that won usually had the strongest assembly of berserkers. Vikings loved their weapons as much as a dog loves going for a ride. A typical raid saw Vikings use axes, swords, bows, and arrows, and daggers, but their go-to weapon of choice was the spear. Inexpensive and easy to make, spears also had reach, which was pretty helpful when a raid devolved into hand-to-hand -hand combat. With a tip made of iron measuring anywhere from 8 to 24 inches, and the wooden shaft usually made of straight grain ash, a Viking spear was used mostly for throwing, but an adept warrior could use theirs for carving, chiseling, and chopping as well. It's like the Viking version of a Swiss army knife. There's little evidence that tells us the length of a shaft from the Viking Age, but chapter 6 of Gila's Saga tells of a spear so long a man's outstretched arm could barely touch the rivet. Of course, most historians estimate that the combined length of a wooden shaft and iron head of a Viking-era spear was between 7 and 10 feet long. Swords were pretty rare in the Viking Age. They were expensive, difficult to make, and very few Vikings owned a good one. That meant that swords were the mark of an elite warrior and treated as heirlooms passed down from bearded father to son for generations. You could determine the quality of a sword by the elaborately decorated hilts or by the bladesmith's name that was imprinted near the base of the blade, just like a brand name imprinted on anything you buy today. Different styles with varying looks were even given nicknames by Vikings like leg biter and gold hilt. Not sure if heart eater or oath keeper ever made it to real life. Most Vikings preferred double-edged swords, ranging in length from 24 to 36 inches long and 1 and a half to 2 and a half inches in width. For older Vikings, a 40-inch sword wasn't uncommon, and they were relatively light. They weighed anywhere between 2 to 4 pounds, depending on length. Of course, Hollywood likes to portray Vikings slashing their victims while holding their swords with a two-fisted stranglehold, but that's not how it went down. If you look at the grip of a sword from the Viking Age, you'll see that it was made for one hand. There was no need for an extended grip on a Viking sword because it would throw off the weight of the weapon, plus their other hand was busy holding a shield anyway. While these swords were usually passed from father to son as heirlooms, there is evidence that some Vikings were buried with them. In these cases, the Viking sword was ritualistically killed, which means its blade was bent so that it was unusable. This served two purposes. It acted as a way to retire the sword with its owner, and it deterred grave robbers from stealing the weapon. When it came to a Viking raid, a warrior had two means of defense, his cunning and his shield. Even though they were made of wood, usually fir, alder, spruce, or poplar, like Mickey Ward, a Viking shield could take quite a beating in battle. A few shields have survived from the Viking Age, and they vary in size from 32 to 36 inches in diameter. It was also noted that a shield was often custom made for a warrior. It was sized to fit the dimensions of his body and his fighting style. A shield needed to be big enough to provide protection, but not too big that it threw off the balance of the warrior. Too small would expose additional lines of attack that an opponent could exploit. Too large would slow the defensive response and exhaust the warrior unnecessarily. There's been great debate about the role of shield maidens in Viking culture, namely whether these powerful women even existed in the first place. Scandinavian folklore and mythology have always been there with tales of bravery and cunning battle prowess. But archaeologists from Uppsala University and Stockholm University have found new DNA evidence that shows female warriors have roots in actual historical events. Technology recently caught up with the excavation of one of the most well-known graves from the Viking Age, a mid-10th century grave in a Swedish Viking town named Birka. The tomb was excavated in the 1880s, revealing the remains of a female warrior surrounded by an axe, a bow and arrow, a sword, armor-piercing arrows, and two horses. But like we said, the folklore and mythology have always been there. According to the Greenland saga, when Leif Erikson's pregnant half-sister, Freydis Erik's daughter, was in Vinland, 
it was written that she grabbed a sword and bare-breasted scared away the attacking Skraelings. In another instance, Viking leader Ligurta commanded a band of 120 ships of warriors. When her ex-husband Ragnar Lothbrok faced near certain defeat in a fight, Ligurta sailed to his rescue, launching a surprise attack on the enemy from behind, reportedly causing Ragnar's opponents to panic. Shield maidens also reportedly fought while disguised in men's clothes. Thus, they were sometimes indistinguishable from male warriors. Yep, shield maidens existed, and they were as badass as their male counterparts. A herd was made up of elite bodyguards with the sole purpose of protecting the Viking chief at the back of the wedge during battles. A wealthy and skilled chief might have as many as 60 herdmen protecting them on the battlefield. These herdmen were smart, always armed warriors, and they guaranteed their leaders' safety. In the Vikings' pecking order, you could think of them as the Navy SEALs. Of course, a herdman's job wasn't only reserved for battles and raids. Due to the fact that an influential Viking chief had enemies lurking everywhere, a herdman was on the clock 24-7. And while a herdman put his life on the line every day, he was rewarded greatly for his services and lived a privileged life that young Vikings envied. A member of a herd was as close to being a celebrity as a Viking could become without actually being royalty. never knew what you were going to get in a Viking raid. Sometimes a tribe's attack was nothing more than a smash and grab affair with the sole intent of grabbing some loot and food and returning to their own village. In cases like these, a raiding party could consist of anywhere between 35 and 300 Vikings. But a full-scale battle was different. Full-scale battles meant entire Viking armies showed up against each other. Bigger Viking armies could contain between 4,000 and 7,000 men, and as the Viking Age wore on, the armies only grew in size. In the early 850s, attacks on the English cities of Canterbury and London reportedly involved 350 Viking ships. If we're to believe these figures, this Viking army may have been at least 10,000 strong. Oh man, imagine drinking your morning tea and seeing 10,000 Vikings heading your way. You've seen the Minnesota Vikings helmet, the 1993 Nintendo classic The Lost Vikings, Hagar the Horrible comic strip, and the Bugs Bunny cartoon called What's Opera, Doc? with Elmer Fudd and his magic helmet. Despite all these iconic cultural influences, a real Viking helmet never had horns. In reality, a Viking helmet was a simple, practical piece of equipment. It was made of iron, and many historians believe that due to cost, only the elite warriors owned them. Most Vikings fought without headgear. In fact, there have only been five Viking helmets recovered, most of which are just fragments and deteriorated pieces of iron. The only full Viking helmet is called the Girmenbu helmet, which now is on display at the Museum of Cultural History of the University of Oslo. So how did the horned Viking helmet myth begin? You can pin that on costume designer Carl Emil Doppler. When composer Richard Wagner staged his Der Rings der Nibelungen opera cycle in the 1870s, he turned to Doppler for the production's costumes. Doppler created horned helmets for the Viking characters and a Nordic stereotype was born. While Vikings owned horses, you'd rarely see one at a raid or battle. The problem with horses was that they were difficult to transport in ships when Vikings sailed off for a raid. Strangely enough, a good number of horses that were acquired by Vikings were taken either by looting them or by stealing them from their defeated enemies, as we know from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle. Most Viking horses were used for farming purposes. The Vikings are even thought to have introduced plowing with horses to the British Isles. The Vikings adopted horses for plowing because they were quicker and more agile than the more commonly used oxen. It's theorized that the Vikings could plow and plant their fields quickly with their horses and then go off raiding for the summer before returning home in time for harvest. There is record of at least one battle where Vikings used horses, but the results weren't so great. During the Battle of Sulcoit in Ireland in 968, the Vikings of Limerick, led by Ivar of Limerick, deployed a cavalry of warriors on horseback. These Vikings were lured into an ambush by the Irish and lost both the battle and the town of Limerick. Even though Viking raids were bloody and brutal, warriors still found the opportunity to swipe right. Proof of this happened in the 9th century when Ragnar Lothbrok led an attack to avenge the death of his grandfather at the hand of a rival king. 
According to passages in the ninth book of the Gesta Danorum, a 12th century work of Danish history by the Christian historian Saxo Grammaticus, King Fro killed Ragnar's grandfather, Seward, and forced the dead king's surviving female family members into a brothel as a form of public humiliation. When he heard about this, Ragnar came with an army of warriors to avenge his grandfather. Many of the women Fro had ordered into the brothel dressed themselves into men's clothes and fought on Ragnar's side. One of those women was Lagerta, a shield maiden whose fierce fighting had attracted Ragnar's attention. After the battle, Ragnar pursued Lagerta and proposed to her. Lagerta feigned interest, and Ragnar arrived to seek her hand. However, Lagerta released a bear and a hound to attack Ragnar, which, according to Saxo, he had to kill before he could marry her. Huh, who said romance was dead? Ragnar killed the bear with a spear and choked the hound to death, thus winning the hand of Lagerta. The couple had a son, Fridleif, as well as two daughters, but eventually Ragnar divorced Lagerta because he apparently still harbored bitterness about the whole bear and hound attack. Totally understandable, right? Let us know what you think. Would you want to be on a Viking raid? Share your thoughts in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other stories on our weird history.